Senator Rosen. Well, thank you, Senator King. Appreciate it. And I want to thank you to the nominees today for testifying for your willingness to serve. Um, it's so important. And I want to talk a little bit about intelligence and great power competition. So Ms. Wilkerson, as the U.S. transitions to great power competition with China and giving the increasing emphasis on technological advancements and cyber capabilities, how is the U.S. intelligence community adapting its methodologies to ensure comprehensive intelligence collection from both traditional and emerging sources? And additionally, what strategies are being implemented to integrate diverse sources of intelligence? And if confirmed, how do you plan to coordinate integration across a defense intelligence enterprise? Senator, thank you for the opportunity to speak a bit on that topic. Um, of course, uh, continuous modernization and deeper integration across the defense intel and security enterprise are critical to supporting the objectives of the national defense strategy. And I think as part of that, really focusing in on how we develop ways to be able to leverage effectively emerging technology and then also expand our ability to, uh, to share intelligence effectively as well with our allies and partners. Um, from my seat in, at NGA, uh, one of the things that I, we've been focused on is how do we take a full advantage of the proliferated architecture uh, and um, how do we take best advantage of AI, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, Geoint AI is where our focus would be. And so I recognize from those experiences the importance of always thinking ahead with respect to and being open to, to new innovations and, and being able to um, pull those in and do so at a rapid manner. And so if confirmed, I would look to work across the department, um, the IC, and as well as with other uh, stakeholders to include allies uh, and partners to, to make sure we're casting a broad net and understanding what exists uh, and where there may be shortfalls that might need to be addressed. Thank you. Yes, technology moves faster sometimes than we can adapt to it. But I'm glad you brought up uh, AI because, of course, there's issues around the ethical use of AI. And the Department of Defense has adopted a set of ethical principles for artificial intelligence, including minimizing unintended bias and protecting civil liberties and privacy. However, we do know our definition of ethical AI does not align with that of our adversaries. So Dr. Solmeyer, as we work to leverage AI into our cyber capabilities, we know it's going to better enable our warfighters to execute their missions, uh, whatever they are. How do you intend to balance uh, the opportunities that we have before us, challenges and opportunities, and the ethical use of AI? Well, good morning, Senator. And I think the opportunity that artificial intelligence offers our warfighters war really is open, open field right now. But what we bring that our adversaries don't is a, a professional military, a military of, of humans that we do trust mm -hmm. and uh, that are trusted with very serious responsibilities at even very junior ranks. And so to use artificial intelligence to empower them, to keep the human in the loop, but to empower them, that is different than what our adversaries will use AI for because I don't think they trust their militaries in the way that we can trust our professional force. Thank you. I, I do think that uh, um, AI just potentiates what humans can do, right? Just helps us make those better decisions. So I would agree with you there. And it's important though, it, we have AI, we are going to have professional war fighters, but we also have to have a cyber workforce and really robust cyber workforce. We have to think forward into the future. And last year, DOD released its cyber workforce strategy really to address those gaps in workforce management, uh, ensure we're really um, capable of addressing the growing cyber threats from our adversaries. So again, Dr. Solmeyer, what's your view on implementing non-traditional methods of expanding cybersecurity workforce including uh, establishing a cyber security uh, reserve or implementing a skills-based hiring in order to increase the number of qualified candidates for cyberspace operations and roles. I'm interested really in the civ civilian cyber reserve. I was a former computer programmer myself. <laughs> yes, yes, Senator, and I've, I've appreciated your leadership on uh, cyber issues and in particular on the civilian reserve uh, I've read the legislation, and uh, we currently have the, the beginning conversations going uh, between the Army, where I work now, and U.S. Cybercom uh, to very consistent with the law to see what we can do 
and how we can meet the, the steps to start that pilot. So I'm excited to see uh, what, what we can do there with this civilian reserve, uh, mostly to be able to have folks from industry who want to serve, but not in a full-time capacity, mm -hmm. maybe in a, in a quiet way, we can call in a crisis or call in the run-up to a crisis to help us with technical expertise, a few days, mm -hmm. week or two at mm -hmm. a time, and then they can go back. Maybe teaching a course, some of those different things. That's exactly right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Um, Senator King. Oh, Senator, Thank you. Senator Reid, you're back. I am. Thank you. 